So I want to welcome everyone to the show, and I am thrilled to have uh, a lady uh, on the show with us from New York City, Mary O'Grady. Mary, uh, writer for the Wall Street Journal. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and spending some time with us here. Sure, sure. Happy to be here. My pleasure. Mary, you are a uh, living legend down here because of the way that you wrote about the situation down here in Honduras. We looked up to you and have so much respect for you. Could you tell me the process that went on up there when you first heard about the uh, change of uh, presidential powers that went on down here? And how did you get it right and so many people got it wrong? Well, I was following the story from the week before. I, I didn't start writing about it on that Sunday, but I was watching what happened on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. And, um, and I also have been writing about um, this kind of um, process that uh, Hugo Chavez used in Venezuela and then other leaders in the region have used to consolidate power under the guise of democracy. So they sort of say, well, this is democracy because people voted and, and uh, because of this we're able to consolidate power. And my own background uh, in this is writing about the importance of institutions and checks and balances on institutions so that no one individual or no one office uh, has too much power because that, of course, is, creates a, a, a form of government that not really in the spirit of what we would consider a democracy, and um, and it's not not constructive for just society. So I was kind of aware of the path that that Manuel Celaya was on, and I also um, am a strong believer that um, the way a functioning democracy should work is that other institutions should have the ability to put checks on the executive. In other words, I don't think of the executive as a strong man um, who can just sort of do whatever he wants. He is in competition with the legislature and the um, high court. And all three of those institutions are supposed to check the other so that, again, no power is concentrated anywhere. And I saw that Celia was going in a, in a, in a different direction from, from that idea. Why do you think so many got it wrong. I mean, when this thing happened, the United States from Obama to uh, Hillary to all the top people came down against us really without even looking into it. How do you think they got it so wrong and why do you think they got it so wrong? Well, one, one of the problems obviously was the fact that the president was taken out of the country by the military in, in the wee hours of the morning. And um, that, of course, uh, for anybody who is just looking at the problem very superficially, that created a very bad image. And I understand that um, the leadership in the country, I thought there was a good reason for that. Um, but, and even, you know, in my recent visit to Honduras, I asked some people about that. And, and there are those who continue to, to defend that decision um, on the basis that they, they think it, it preserved human life and, and that there wasn't really anywhere to put the president and so forth. But, but nevertheless, because that created a bad image. You know, I think also there is a pretty poor understanding of the role that the military is obliged to play in a democracy to uphold the Constitution. And, of course, this has in part been promoted or, or um, supported by um, the, the fact that the left has gotten really controls the narrative in academia and in the media. So um, for many people who ideologically are opposed, were sort of supporting um, the kinds of things that Celia wanted to do, something that in Latin America is often referred to as participatory democracy, which just basically means majority rules. So if the majority, 51% of the people want to do something to 49% of the people, this is supposed to be um, justified under a model that has been promoted um, by the left in academia and in the media. So I think 
you know, for people who believe ideologically in what Celia was doing and who think that, you know, the military should never be in a position to uphold the Constitution, they, they felt it was wrong that the military should have intervened. And that's, I mean, as I say, that's kind of an ideological divide because there are people who believe there's a constitution and a rule of law for a reason and that the military has an obligation to defend that. And one of the, one of the things that uh, for all of us Americans, and there are thousands and thousands of us that live down here, one of the things that was the hardest for us to get used to is that this is not the United States. <laughs> this, we don't go under the U.S. Constitution. Things are different down here, as is the Constitution. It is different. And I think when uh, people made snap judgments, they were thinking that we have the same Constitution down here that they have in the United States. Well, I, I'm sure that there was, well, there was part of that. But, you know, one thing that I said was imagine if George led a mob down Pennsylvania Avenue to some place where ballots for, for an illegal referendum were stored and, and you know, inside of that mob to break into the warehouse and, and take the ballots out. I mean, I don't, I don't think any president, left or right in this country, would have been defended. Now, obviously, we have better uh, mechanisms for dealing with that problem, and I think that was one of the things that came up here was we saw how frail the institutions were. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about the fact that there, you know, there wasn't this very clear mechanism for impeaching a president. So it seems like there was, at some level, a little bit of confusion about what the different options were to deal with this guy. Um, but I think at, on one level, the behavior of Celia would never have been tolerated in this country. And in that sense, I thought it was a very sort of paternalistic, condescending attitude that was taken towards Honduras to say, you know, well, we would never put up with that, but you have to. The other thing that I found outrageous, if, if I can say that, is the Secretary of State's decision to strip the visas wow. from the Supreme Court justices, because I think that there is a case of what you're talking about, whereby, you know, the Supreme Court justices um, know the Constitution. I mean, that's what their job is. And for us to tell them that we don't like the way they're interpreting their own Constitution is a, a pretty colonial uh, <laughs> um, stance, you know, and you don't expect it from you know, a left of center government in this country, which has spent, you know, the last 25 years saying that, you know, U.S. hegemony in the region is the problem and we should let countries make their own decisions. We were pretty outraged by that also. One or two last questions. I know that you have to go and I really appreciate you spending time with me. I'll tell you what, I'll let you pick out the one question that you want to answer. Number one, you came down to see for yourself. The Republicans came down to see for themselves. And the Democrats, which I've been my whole life so embarrassed, they had nothing to do with us. They couldn't have cared less. I'd love for you to answer that. The other question I'd like to put to you is the Library of Congress. I won't even say anything more than that. If you'd love to answer both, I'd love to hear from you. Okay, well, let me try uh, to do both of them. On the first question, you know, it's really speculation. I don't have any kind of, you know, special plugged-in source in the administration that can tell me, you know, why they took the stance that they took. Um, but my best guess is that there was a sort of a combination of factors at, at play. I mean, surely there were some people in the administration and, and in Congress, Democrats, who had some kind of a um, uh, an ideology sh shared or sympathized with the ideology of Celia. You know, there is a, a large gap between the rich and the poor, and there's not only that. I mean, I think the bigger problem and something I've written about often in Latin America is that economic mobility is uh, very difficult. I mean, in all countries, you're going to have income inequality. That's just a fact of life. But what is wonderful about the United States is that people can move from one income category to another if they work hard because there are things like equality under the law. And so we all agree that that's a problem, but I think ideologically there, were num there are a number of people in the Democratic Party who think that the solution to that problem are things like Celia was doing, forcing higher minimum wages, which from my perspective cause higher rates of unemployment in the yeah. formal sector, and, and sort of, you know, redistributing wealth. And uh, so that was one uh, reason why he was supported. 